Many times we feel like Christians, this is not an area we need to venture in. But we are believing that most of the time our Kenyan church has um, behaved uh, as uh, in more reactive than responding. And so we decide to mediate when things are worse. But we want to be very deliberate about talking about politics. And we think that this will inform us as we move towards electioneering period. Our senior pastor began us last week about uh, why the church is silent. And I believe that we can arise and say something and do something if the glory and honor of God. So today I will be talking about the paradox of Kenyan politics. Uh, so that will be my subject. I'm praying that God will help me to speak God's word. My wife has prayed and many of you have prayed. It just challenge us to move from a point of inaction to action. Amen? And I want to define paradox because maybe I may be using a term that's very difficult. Uh, paradox means something that is seemingly absurd or a contradiction of a statement. That when you find out or you move with it, you come to realize that it is actually true. So that is a paradox. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a paradox when it looks like it's a contradiction. And sometimes our Kenyan politics could be that. The synonyms of this is contradiction. Contradictions in terms of self contradiction, inconsistency. You can't see a consistency of a matter, incongruity, anomaly. Okay, a conflict, absurdity, or oddity. Some other people say, people say, conundrum, oxymoron, or mystery, a puzzle. That is what we talk about as a paradox. So we are looking at a puzzle of Kenyan politics. Many of you play code words. You may never play A and plus B and get Z in Kenyan politics. Uh, I saw some people who won in denominations and they ended up being told, yeah, you won, but please be this. Now, that's a puzzle. That's a code word that we play in the Kenyan politics. So, but I will be looking at it in the sense of us as a church because our study this season is the role of the church in politics. And so, in this sense, what is our role when we are having a paradoxical way of dealing with elections where even people fear to get into elections, yet God has called us to be the light and the soul of the world. So I will be using the word church in this context to refer to all of us who assemble in this place. Sita Meldor, you are a believer, and then I will refer to you as a church. I will also refer to you as a church if you are a believer in individual capacity. You as Bire, you as Ibrahim, you as Arena, or whichever. What do you do as a church when politics is on the table or around us? I gave a story in the morning that I want to share with us, that I grew up in a village. We didn't have electricity, but for many of you who have electricity, we have something called a uh, security light. I don't know whether it has bullets, but it's called security light. It keeps off the, the thieves. Well, what does it do? What does the security light do? It keeps you secure. Now, um, one morning, one evening, or around dark, we had some footsteps outside. And definitely on those days, and many of you still operate like that, you have a torch that uh, now if something happens, you would go outside and look what that person is walking around. We dashed out, uh, my cousins were very small boys. And of course, somebody was walking around our cow shed. So when you put the torch like this, you run hiding and he runs away. When you put the light on him, you look for something to hide. So definitely, Light will chase darkness. That is essentially the thing, the lesson in that. So the person went and where he go to disappear, you put the light, you can't see them. But now imagine a scenario where the light is not chasing away darkness. That we have Kenyans that are 80% Christian either by name and we have more percentage of corruption. Just imagine that we have more churches growing um, in number, uh, in terms of capacity, and many of them in a certain town, but yet evil continues to thrive. Is light chasing out darkness, or darkness is chasing light? 
But the truth of the matter is a single light like the one here, it will chase a lot of darkness. Another story I want to give you is we also come, I come from a um, sugar growing zone. And sometimes if you look for sugar cane to, to take, you would go in a place which is muddy and chilly, you cut one good um, uh, sugar cane. So I did one point, and um, one which I chosen, because if you have lived in sugar cane, you also choose, you don't just cut any to chew, unless you are a company to go and make sugar. But for you, if you want to chew, there is some, some of us know, in fact, you take the stem that is lowest. I took one at one point, and I realized that it was sugarless. <laughs> some paradox, that sugar cane can be tasteless. Think about those stories as we continue. This morning, there is a widespread view that politics is dirty and it has its owners. Our former bishop, Oginde, once said that it is too dirty that only a Christian can cleanse it. So many of us have taken a backstage while the so-called owners, we have the owners of this, drive the agenda in politics, they call, to, they call to engage in political arena, therefore it's so critical. It will us in a few months, just before our elections, and we shall be there for calling us to be participators, and one of the things, if you read through this book, we are calling us to engage as citizens, we are people that need to vote, for you to vote, uh, you need to be a citizen. I know some of my friends who are not citizens, and some are here, um, I met one, they have not got the predicts, so they will not vote. But you as a citizen, you have a role to do, to vote. As mediators, we're looking forward to have advocates, we have people who are talking in the morning and say custodians and observers. So that will be our quest in this study, and it remains my call to encourage us to be participators. But how, we have, how have we been faring on as Kenya in terms of this area? Already I have a few candidates. For those of you who lifted up your hands, you have become my illustration in this service, not to shame you. <laughs> you fear participating in elections, and we have not been faring so well as Christians. When we are many, and yet people are choosing for us who to become our leader. It should disturb us, because it seems that we are not around the table I will always cry fall for being on the menu. We are being served, okay? You are either around the table or you are in the menu. Ask your neighbor, are you around the table or you are on the menu? It's lunchtime. Ask them. They give you an answer. Are you on the menu, Mr. Carey, or you are around the table? <laughs> so we bear a very huge responsibility for transforming, to transforming very many great worldview that election is dirty and us we sit to watch. And I would want us to introspect this subject in looking at Kenya and God's word. So I'm talking about um, the, paradox of, the paradox of Kenyan elections, but I'll be reading two scriptures, one from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, and then I'll read Romans chapter 2, Verse 17 to 22. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, that you are the soul of the light. You are the soul of the light. If the soul loses its saltness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You could imagine if you put yourself there. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. We can't hide ourselves and bury ourselves in the, our heads in the sand. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under the bowl or a bush. Instead, they put it on his stand and it gives light to everyone. You must mark that everyone, okay, in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good, your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I almost pause there and ask us, if we are a Christian serving, would people go and admire that person? 
I remember the recent times we just had one of man of the caller going to EACC and people say, this one is going to be like the other one. How many of you know the story? And we had a Muslim brother there and people were saying, yes, that can transform. This is a narrative that I want us to introspect this particular afternoon and I believe God will speak to us. In Romans chapter 2, verse 17, uh, 17 to 23, which is my main text here, the Bible says, now, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of, for what is superior, because you are instructed by law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, because you have in the Lord the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You can underline knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you teach yourself? You who preach again and stealing, like the preacher here, do you steal? You who say to the people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now, this is the paradox now. This is where I've got my passage. This is a Jew, a select, born person for God. Now, the Bible is accusing the Jews for knowing the law, but yet doing the contrary. And they have been found guilty that they rob the temples, that they know the law to teach the truth and something else. They don't do that. They stand on the pulpit and they just make a presentation. A very big paradox in this place. Actually, you read in chapter 2, verse 10 to 11, and the Bible says, and you will be the first to be judged before I judge the Gentiles. Because you have the law. You have the position, but yet you've done a contradiction. Could that be a scenario? I could saw Kenyans in this passage. While the Bible was writing to the Jews, and God knew that all of us would be in that context, I saw ourselves in this place. Now, these people were not just robbing the counties. The Jews were robbing the temples. Just imagine that our offering in this place could disappear. And so God is angry with them. In fact, in this place, God is not addressing them nicely. I'll be very nice today. Buana Suesa. A paradox because I'm a Kenyan. I'm sympathetic to my son. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and so in this place, God is angry. He say, you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by law, but you are convinced. And you are convinced you are the blind, you are the, the guide to the light. But you are not leading. Now, the blind are the people who do not know what is right and what is God. Now, if the church becomes blind and does not offer solution, then that becomes a problem. And so I want us to look at some few things in this passage just before I get to my message. To understand the context of Romans chapter 2, verse 17, all the way to 22. I've already mentioned, we have a proud Jew. All of us are proud Kenyans. Kenyans are not ordinary people. They're, these are extraordinary. I was told that you are creators. You are very creative. I'm contemplating to write one book called Made in Kenya because Kenyans don't give up easily. You cannot dampen a Kenyan spirit easily. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I lived in Nongai and uh, the county came and brought shops of the Mamambogas down. And the people came and they found it down. No one cried. They just looked for something else and they continued to sell that day. That's a Kenyan spirit. Proud Kenyans. In fact, they have an airline that is actually talked of proud of Africa. So they were proud Jews. They were born from Abraham's lineage. That's about 17 to 22. They were convinced, like I'm convinced today that I can speak to us and God. They were convinced that they were the, the lie to the blind. We are convinced that way. And we talk to ourselves and say, we can manage these elections. They were the light for those in darkness. In fact, Isaiah chapter 60 verse 2 prophesies and say, when the glory of God shines upon you, you're going to be the light in the darkness. There is a light that is shining and coming upon us. They have a form of knowledge and truth. You do have it. You have a truth knowledge about what we want for this nation. Some to truth, some knowledge. Some of us have gone to school and that's why God has helped us. We can do some statistics compare 
contrast, say this stand with this. You, we have some form of truth. The Jews had that form of truth. But they lacked this truth. Praise the Lord. So the Bible continues and says, they were superior teachers. Like some of us are. I'm speaking to us. Verse 19 to 20. Just like Kenyans. We're very good in politics. Um, I was making the same statement in the morning and I can make it here. That when Uganda is voting, Kenyans are always voting. They are on Twitter trying to see yeah, why Uganda has never had a dead president. They have one president who is always alive. You know. Kenyans know that, and they would make a comment about that. When the U.S. is voting, Kenyans are there. They are there night and day. They are superior teachers, I'm telling you. Now, you rob the temples. <laughs> now, I don't know whether you rob temples, but we, we do corruption in this nation. It's on a high level. Not just Kenya, but, I, but today I'm just on Kenyans. The Jews were robbing the temples. They were corrupt. They were withholding part of the temple tax and offering. So if it's 10%, you calculate it. Ay, 20,000? No, no, I keep that. They were withholding that. So those were Jews. I'm talking about Jews. I'm coming to you Kenyans later. And that was against the common practice according to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25. Because the Bible says, you are to bring a whole offering. You are to bring a whole tithe. So there were sharp contrasts, okay? There were sharp contrasts um, for most Jews. As you look at that, and that's why Paul writes, he sees a very big and very huge paradox in that place. And so he said, you teach, you preach. You have a position and a lineage. But you are guilty. That is what he's speaking. Of. You are guilty like non-believers. That's what Paul is saying. In fact, in verse 10 and verse 11, he says, we will come for you first before we come for those who do not know the Lord. What were they guilty of? I'm moving a little fast. We think that we see Paul accusing the Romans and the Jews, the, the, the Jews in this context of this letter. Three things. One, deception. You know, you can deceive yourself. Verse 21 to 22. They deceived themselves by practicing what they had preached against. Preaching today about politics. Then I leave here and say, yes, I preach to them. So they were guilty of deception. Kenyans are very good. When politicians come with money, they say, we will give you votes. Another one comes, they will give you votes. Now they are like Jews. I saw Kenyans in this place. You might see them also. It was a paradox, my friend. This was a conundrum. This was an oxmoron. Speaking big English, my friend. These things, they were not of common practice. The next thing these people were guilty of, of dishonor. Jews were children of God. And we are children of God. So God says, I have my offering. You have my word. You have my everything. But you have dishonored me. Verse 21 to 23 say. Mention the blood and breaking of God's law. You can imagine just refusing to give the temple tax. It did not match of what they were to do. They were to preach. They were not preaching. In fact, they say, and they preached some few things or many things, and they did not do that. So this, they dishonored God. They blasphemed his name. The law which they thought they would do. So they dishonored God. And thirdly, we see them guilty of destruction. They lived in the way they did while claiming to be God's people. We are God's people, but we don't vote. And yet you expect God to be, and say God's will may be done. Okay? They were guilty of blasphemy. False prophet. They destroyed the credibility of God. That we are people of God, but we cannot be a light that people can see the light of God in us. Apart from seeing ourselves. A very dangerous thing. So they were guilty of destruction. They destroyed the name of God. They made people who admired to go to that church and say, if that is the pastor that was preaching, and I have seen him in this place, watch I guy. That is what the Jews did. They were guilty of destruction. They were guilty of dishonor. And they were guilty of deception. 
So what are the four paradoxical things about the Kenyan politics in light of what I've just looked at? Four of them, I'll be done. Four paradoxical things about this. One, a paradox of a corrupt Christian. It's a paradox. A Christian should never be corrupt. Buana Swesan. So it is paradox, but if you go and find out that there is one. <laughs> the one that served you was in charge today. It's a paradox. It left me wondering, when I think about this, Christian should not be corrupt, and so it's a paradox. Why would an 80% Christian country be having more than 80% uh, corruption and evil? There are two things that should reduce it's a paradox. Give him more food, he asks for more food. That's a paradox. So who are the corrupt? If 80% are Christian, the 20, where are the 60%? Mathematicians cannot tell you. It's a paradox, I'm telling you. Ordinary thieves chooses who to rob. But a corrupt Christian, I'm saying a corrupt Christian, will choose which Christian to rob him or rob her. One as we said. The ordinary thief will come and choose. Nangalia hapa naona huyu ni deacon. He's the only deacon here, so you go for him. Man, that's an ordinary. But now a corrupt Christian will come here and say, come and rob me. Come and Please come. Eh? Engineer Magomere, come and rob me. That's a paradox. This is what you do. We choose who to rob us. And that's why I will be calling us to engage. We fight to defend our belongings when we are ordinary. In the ordinary sense, you protect your stuff. But when you are corrupt, you'll always defend the person who steals your things. Is that not a paradox? We can go on streets, way to, way to, way to, way to. That is it. And the politicians have known that. Once they are in the cells, they post two videos, we are there on Ikimadi streets, and they are out. It's a paradox, my friend. What a time to live as a Christian. The second paradox is the paradox of a political evasive Christian. Political evasive Christian is a Christian that knows that the elections and politics determines everything that happens, but doesn't want to engage. To me, that's a paradox. I cannot be a person, like for example, politics is everywhere. Uh, we serve the senior pastor and sit in the advisory board. So every time I avoid to sit in the advisory, maybe because it's stormy, but the way it, sometimes it gets stormy. That's a paradox. That's lack of responsibility, for lack of a better word. That just because it's dirty, I cannot sit around. We need many of you to gather courage and not avoid it. Otherwise, it's paradoxical to avoid things. The sole responsibility of a leader is to be there when things are tough and be there. But when you are running away and you're expecting solutions, it's a paradox. It's like a man that is saying, I'm ahead of the house, and when the lion comes, you take your wife and say, take this, take my children. That's a paradox. And that's where many of us live. We have put our light in the bush, in the bowl, and we feel it's okay. We are like sugar cane that tastes nothing. Salt that is saltless. Sadly, some Christians have lived in their own self-precious mode. We are good. Politics is for them. A Christian who wants change, but is afraid or afraid to engage. Now, I say this, the people that are, um, they are, they are not around the table, but they expect to be around the decision making. So long as you are not around the table, you will always be on the menu. Let me tell you, we'll continue to pray and say, question and many things. Let's be around the table. And that is the call not to avoid elections. I challenged people in the first service. that some of you, even if you apply to be IBC, enumerators, and, and you fail, go and apply to be an observer. No one will pay you, but you'll be around on the table so that you will not be served on 9th August. The third paradox is the paradox 
of a tribal Christian. In this sense, I'm saying a Christian should never be tribal. It's a paradox. Um, I'm, you, to see how we vote, we vote along tribal lines. We do many things. May I say that voting for your tribe person does not mean you're tribal. But if the tribe is the one that is making you vote for that person, then you're tribal. You understanding what I'm saying? So a Christian is a Christian first. And so he looks at values. He looks at ethics. Are we together? So when he enter there, you first of all look at which name comes from my village. Then you are tribal. But it's very paradoxical for you to claim you are Christian and yet you are tribal. It's paradoxical, I'm telling you. It is contradictory. If you are a Christian, you don't love other people. After this service, look for somebody from other tribe and then pester them. And tell them, I am the Christian. I had a message from Pastor Bui. Today, a sign of love and offering. To me, a Muzuri, a lunch. It's about 500 to 1,000 of another tribe. If you hurt them, if you hurt them, praise the Lord. I want to change the paradox. I want to eat some lunch in some places that maybe you think you should not. And you cook your chikula, your food. If somebody is from the other place, give them some samaki. If they hurt samaki and say, I love you, that's why I've given you this samaki. It's a paradox for a Christian to be tribal. Because we are called to season the light. The, la the last and not the least. A paradox of a solitary Christian. The Bible says, you are the light. Okay? So if you find a Christian that is no testing, that has no value of test. Like the, the salt is just needed in small quantities, just like light to illuminate this place. So if you are saltless Christian, this is a paradox. And actually, both uh, the author of Matthew and this bring this out. Okay? So are we faring well if we are Christian, yet we are stateless? People have come around us. They say, no. Some of my young people I met, they say, I'm getting afraid of getting married to Christians. We are saltless. We are no longer being admired because we have sold, lost our life. So the paradox of the Christian, saltless Christian the paradox of a tribal Christian, and for some of you who have cross married, that's okay. For some of you who have not released your children to make, um, to change this paradox. Paradox of political evas evasive Christian and the paradox of a Christian who is corrupt. What next? I think I'm moving a little bit fast because of time. While these elections and us Kenyans um, be where we are, as a church, we are saying that it's not lost. Uh, many people were taught this way, but we can change the paradox. Amen? Yes, we can change the narrative and be able to engage. And one of the things is clear the bushes by becoming a participator. So we are asking you that you can participate in this election. Educate somebody. Be, get your vote. Go and vote. Don't just be good. Eh? Say, sisu naesabia tu kwa nyumba wanaesabu tu naesabu uko nasaba kwa Cloud, I'm asking you, go and be an observer in the name of Jesus. Radiate the light because God has asked you to stand for truth, voice concerns. When we see some anomaly, okay, go there and see, you know, sometimes God is asking that we don't keep quiet. I talk a lot, but I will not keep quiet on evil. That's my challenge. I would rather speak it. I want to ask us Christians. Um, one of my neighbors, my wife knows, Funza kuwa mwanaume. He had a posho meal. So one day he was doing that posho meal, and the vidole ended there, and he can't cry. See, we are just hearing, looking like this. All the fingers are gone. The man didn't cry. We go there, he has no fingers. He's sweating. That's how Christian. We are suffering when our fingers are in the posho meal. <laughs> My friend, it's time to cry. Men in the house, we've been taught to not to cry. To me, pinye liwa. Eh? You know, Bishop was telling the singles yesterday that your wife is either mentor or tormentor. But when you are tormented, make notes, my friend. Senior pastor talked about that. Say, we're in Yamaza. Now, to me, My 1,000 cannot even buy my children's snack this afternoon. To me, finywa. Now, to me, Yamaza, too. Now, you're saying, we just vote. My friend. It's a paradox here. Seize on the politics by changing the narrative that is dirty. We, can, we are the only one that can change it. 
Because the blood of Jesus washes away every sin. Buana swe sana. It is dirty, so we want to go there and clean it. Hallelujah. Ah, I'm getting excited. I don't want to buy for any position. I'm charging you. You can pray for God in leadership. You make a noise and pray that they will be there. We'll be praying for uh, 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 His Excellent Ruben Kigame that God go ahead. We pray for God in leadership. Let me say, let me say with a lot of humility, Your Excellency, if you don't miss, you are going to be the yardstick of judgment. Many people didn't see this. When God will come to judges, According to values, say, yes, you are Jew, but you do not use values to select. With a lot of humility, I'm telling you. That's a yastic. Because in election, there are three winners. No, two. Those on God's side and those on man's side. Although they can be both the losers on God's side. So three of them. One is a yardstick, another one. That's why we buy ourselves and stand there. You go for that interview as a Christian, they miss you. You would have become a yardstick of measurement. You are a barometer. But is it possible for God also to use an ungodly person? This is an assignment that you can think. God is possible to do that. Because God used Nebuchadnezzar at one point. So you can also pray for them. That those that are buying, they will be used by God. I want to move a little bit faster because of time. Um, um, Actually, I'm moving towards the end of the conclusion. I should say that we are required, uh, as we read through these passages, to notice that God um, has the reasons to be angry with the Jews because they were given a privileged position. I say this in most of my leadership. I told even men, if things go wrong here, uh, senior and I will be responsible, solely responsible. We cannot run away, let me tell you. Because we are privileged for the positions of what you are. And you also, where you are as a Kenyan, you will be solely responsible for everything that will happen to this nation if you don't do the right thing. And that's why the Jews are being asked and they say, you know the law, you know the truth, and you have not done it. You have preached it, but you have done against it. You will understand, I'll say, why God is angry with them and sin. You will understand why there were some people they were committed, and God is saying that I will be able to act in wrath for you. So chapters, chapter 2, you read it, you realize he's calling them and asking them not to be hypocritical. He's asking them to come out of that hypocritical state and be what God wants them to do. So these verses which have, we had the earlier letters, God's judgment on us as Christians is that um, it wants us to shine, to be able to, God's wrath, um, what I'm saying is, which addresses read, God's judgment of the religious man who shines not his light. God will punish that who does not do what is right. Many people believe being Christian is good enough, but they don't do anything. I'm telling you, just like an unbeliever, will be fast to be put there. In fact, the Bible says, for us who are teachers of law, and that does only refer to us Christians, the earth pastors and elders and deacons, it refers to you for the fact that you are God and Israel. You will be fast to be judged. Then we bring those people that have not heard the word of God. They, they will be very bad. So God is asking us to walk the talk. When you read at Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 16, and, and Romans chapter this, he's calling us to walk the talk. Even us, Sitam Eldoret. So we need to know that the place of distraction, which we are guilty of, will not just be full of people that did not go to church or didn't subscribe to our God, it will be full of people that knew what to do and they did not do what is right. So these verses tell us why we need to change the paradox. My call is to change the paradox and look at a position of Christian and serve in the matters of leadership. And I call unto us that you can participate in any way. Don't just see some few things in your mouth, no, 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 no. You can get your mutuetu, but check the values, check the ethics. Check the credibility so that we will not be so even Christians use the same yes stick that the other people use in their lives. I want you to bow down your head and pray for yourself. Pray that God will help you in this place, that you can change your narrative. For many of you who have been fearing about elections, yes, indeed, maybe because of what you went through or people said about that, 
but ask God to forgive you. Even the way you have looked at some Christians, some of you have been able to blaspheme brothers that have given them staff to go to elections. That's a paradox. It is only a Christian that can change the lie, the darkness that is in our country. And we pray that God is forgiving us. We pray that God is leading us. We pray that God is guiding us in his way that we may change this paradox and make this Kenya a great country and to make the livelihood of our children and the life to come to be a great life and that any of us and every one of us can live in any part of this country without fear because there is a Christian sitting in a position of authority that any of us can purchase property in any corner of this country and they will feel safe because we are Christian. We may, may God may help us to change the narrative, the paradox of leadership in terms of politics. So Lord, we thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.